I'm I'm David. Uh, this is understanding real world real world concurrency bugs in Go. Um, uh, bear with me. I've never done a remote talk like this before, especially not one over Twitch. I can't even see what I'm doing. I can barely even see my own output. Uh, so we're kind of flying blind here. I can see the chat though. Uh, so uh, if you have questions, uh, put them in the chat. I will get to them at the end of each se uh, sec section. Um, yeah, uh, let's just, let's kind of just dive into it here. Uh, what is this paper? Uh, uh, understanding real world concurrency bugs in Go uh, is a was uh, released about a year ago now. Uh, these four writers, I'm I'm going to try and pronounce them: uh, Teng Feng Tu, Li Hai Song, Xiao Yu Yu, and Yi Ling Zhang. I think that's more or less correct. Uh, my apologies, to all four of them, for the butchering I just did of their names. Uh, and it's an examination of the uh, of bugs in Go programs related to the usage of uh, concurrency programming and uh, multi-threading programming in Go. Uh, and of course, uh, part of the reason that they're interested in this is that Go has uh, their uh, uh, channels and such that are uh, more interesting to, uh, you know, seen as sort of a new way to do programming uh, outside of just using locks. Uh, so a few notes on these slides. Uh, any unattributed block quotes you see in here are from the paper. Uh, this entire slide deck is made using uh, the Go present uh, tool chain. Uh, and I am going to file some bug reports because this thing is definitely was written for for Rob Rob Pike's usage and has not seen a lot of uh, 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 you know heavy duty usage I think outside of the Go team. Uh, these slides are up at that URL uh, GitHub.com slash delta slash Go concurrency talk if you want to see them. Uh, I would be pushing. I think I have a couple of small updates I've made since I last pushed, um, but they're more or less there. Uh, and this talk is structured how I read a paper. Uh, we start off with a dive through some of the history, some of the citations on the paper, and then move it through uh, history and background on the topic, and then implement very various pieces of it. Uh, and I've done that in the slides, and we'll be able to see some of that uh, work, and then work through some of the conclusions they've come to. Um, I picked this paper uh, as a paper that I was very interested in, not necessarily one I loved. And as I worked with it, uh, my feelings became even more mixed on the paper. So I think we'll, it'll, this will be a little bit different than our standard papers we go uh, paper. But papers we love talk, where it's someone who just really loves the uh, the output and the paper. So, uh, uh, also one other personal note: uh, when we I originally was scheduled to do this paper in person uh, at our at the uh, uh, Datadog offices, um, that was right as the pandemic was starting, uh, and so we did not do that. We pushed it back. We pushed it back, and then said, "Well, let's just try an online one." When we picked this date a month ago, I figured I would be talking about. Uh, how weird it was to be giving a talk at a time when 100,000 people had died in the country. Uh, I did not expect to also be giving this talk at a time when there's a massive police brutality also happening in this country. Um, so I just want to uh, note uh, how strange it is right now to be uh, American and be a New Yorker um, when there are, you know, the police are beating people's heads in with, with sticks. Uh, and to remind people to keep your images of this period in your mind, not just in the days and weeks to come, but in the months to years. Um, remember um, uh, what has happened and keep that in mind in the decisions you make in your life going forward. Uh, keep that, the knowledge you have, you, you have from this, this strange period in our lives to uh, decisions you make and moral decisions you make the rest of your life. We're going to segue horribly right out of that into something much less important, talking about Go. And of course, my slides have stopped progressing. Why? Oh, we're all over the place. OK. So section one, a just brief introduction to Go and CSP and message passing. Uh, the first thing the paper does is it comes right out and starts talking about message passing and uh, and uh, CSP theory. Uh, and so we'll just talk about what that is. Uh, that most famously, and sort of broken down in communicating sequential processes. Uh, very famous paper. Uh, it's extremely heavily cited um, by uh, C. A. R. Hoare. Uh, he was at the time in Northern, in Northern Ireland. His his uh, his personal his personal page at that. Uh, his current university notes the trouble he sometimes had in teaching in Northern, Northern Iowa during these, th during these years, you know, 1978. Um, but at the time, he, of course, did put out a communicating sequential processes theory, uh, which breaks down a general purpose model of inter-process communication. And here, process is being defined extremely loosely. It centers in the concept of inputs and outputs between processes that, that can be linked together. 
Um, for some people listening here, this may sound very much like shells and pipes, and that's because those shells and pipes are sort of based on it. Uh, the paper's a landmark, and basically everyone cites it constantly. Uh, Erlang is based on this model, Linux pipes are based on this model, and uh, Russ Cox mentioned this in, history, in his history of Bell Labs and CSP threads. Um, he has a, uh, this is a link if you pull up the slides. Uh, he has a long, uh, Russ Cox has a long piece on his experience working with uh, CSP at Bell Labs. Of course, the Unix pipe mechanism doesn't require a linear layout, only the shell syntax does. McElroy reports toying with a syntax for shell with general plumbing early on, but not liking the syntax enough to implement it. Later shells did support some restricted forms of nonlinear pipelines. Roshkind's 2D shell supports DAGs. Tom Duff's uh, RC supports trees. I can't even imagine what this actually looks like in practice. Uh, I mean, I guess it would be something like named pipes, but even those are kind of complicated and hard to understand. Um, but as an aside, as I was reading about this, I was reminded of a game I'd played uh, called TIS 100 from Zactronics. Zactronics is a uh, big programming games, uh, which sounds, it depend, depending on what kind of person you are, it's either horrifying or the best thing ever. Um, it's basically what if you could do your day job for fun as well. Uh, here's a screenshot of what the TIS 100 looks like. Uh, you can see here each little block has a little bit of programming in it, and they communicate over synchronous channels. Uh, if you try and write into it, you can't. The uh, progress stops in the one you're writing out of until something picks it up on the other end. Uh, so if you want to actually experiment with what this looks like in a sort of very game uh, fun way, which you know, I highly recommend TIS 100. It's available on Steam and anywhere else you can get. A, uh, I think Good Old Games and all that. Uh, so uh, definitely check that out if you're interested. Uh, if you want to write sort of a, uh, 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 it's it's extremely limited programming, but it is full programming. I think you could talk about these things being turn complete. Um, but it, it definitely reminded me a lot of some of the descriptions uh, of this game. So um, let's keep going. Uh, as soon as my slides decide to continue, I think there's, my computer doesn't love having to do uh, all the various things it has to do. This is, I am not set up for streaming. There we go. Uh, so what does all this have to do with Go, of course? Um, the Go FAQ says one of the most successful models for providing high level linguistic support for concurrency comes from Hora's communicating se sequential processes. Occam and Erling are two well-known languages. Go's concurrency premises, primitives derive from a different part of the family tree whose main contribution is a powerful notion of channels as first class objects. Experience with several earlier languages has shown the CSP model fits well into procedural language framework. We'll see if that's true, but it's but definitely Go from the very beginning has talked about you know has how important channels are to the concept, not just of Go being sort of a simple safe C, but also making part of that safety comes from using not just shared memory but channels as a way to uh, to, to communicate as opposed to just passing shared memory around. Uh, like you don't get you don't get pointers in Go, so instead you get uh, channels. Uh, and of course, all of this comes through Rob Pike. Um, it would be unfair, probably, to say that Rob Pike is the one behind all of these things. I think there's lots of people involved uh, in these languages and these projects over the years. Bell Labs is not a small place, um, but he is he is definitely involved in all of these different languages. I'm, I'm noting here. Um, New Squeak, Squeak and New Squeak were, gu were GUI-focused programming languages. Um, Plan 9 and Inferno. Uh, Plan 9 an operating system, Inferno an operating system that came after Plan 9. Um, Limbo uh, was, of course, the CSP-focused language that was created specifically for Inferno. And then, of course, Go at Google. Um, to call out a couple of these puns, uh, Squeak and New Squeak were so named because they heavily involved mice, as in pointing devices. Um, Limbo and Inferno are, of course, paired as, as various, uh, you know, afterlifes. Uh, uh, the, uh, the virtual machine that Limbo ran on was called DIS, D-I-S, uh, which is, of course, the city in hell where sinners who actively chose to sin were sent. It's the, uh, it's, uh, I believe it's circles six through nine of hell in Dante's Inferno. Uh, so if there's anything that Rob Pike lo loves, apparently it's a good pun when naming things. Uh, and of course, Go uh, picks up on that as well. Uh, talk a little bit more about Squeak and New Squeak. Um, they were definitely CSP derived. Uh, they were focused almost entirely on, uh, on GUI output. Um, these slides not going forward is really getting annoying. Um, uh, the paper that sort of describes Squeak and New Squeak most specifically is a concurrent window system. Again, this is a link if you want to pull up the slides on that on my website later. Uh, breaking down exactly how it's implemented, how it works. As part of that, it mentions CSP and Newsweek. This is a, a quote from that paper. 
Uh, the channels carry messages between processes in new squeak. Hence, within the Windows system are synchronous bufferless channels, as in communicating sequential processes, uh, but carry objects, not just integers. These, this syntax should look very, very similar to people who use Go. Um, when both is, so it, once a, a sender tries to send on a channel, it blocks until the receiver is ready, and then they send the message over and then both continue on their way. Uh, CSP and Go, uh, Thomas Kapler has implemented all the examples from that original 1978 paper in, uh, in Go. Uh, that's the URL there, github.com slash thomas11 slash CSP. It's seven years old now, but Go has not changed that much, and CSP has definitely not changed that much. Um, the Go blog, back in 2010, wrote, uh, broke down share memory back communicating, which sort of breaks down some of the similar reasons why CSP is implemented in, uh, er, why Go uses CSP. And of course, uh, Sir Charles Anthony Richard Hoare, Tony, is still alive in his 80s and living and working in the UK. He has a website. Uh, and he uh, and CSP is probably not even the thing that he's most famous for. He also developed Quicksort uh, and worked on Algol 60. So uh, you have, of course, the entire history of C languages uh, uh, to, blame, to blame him for. And also introduced the concept of the null reference to computer science and has... And it has um, uh, apologized profusely for it ever since. Um, there's also a wonderful quote here uh, that may be relevant to some folks who are interested in um, uh, formal modeling, which I think some of the people in uh, you know, paper, the papers community might be. Uh, on formal methods, 10 years ago, researchers into formal methods, and I was among the most mistaken of them, predicted that the programming world would embrace with gratitude every assistance promised by formalization to solve the problems of reliability that arise when programs get large and more safety critical. Programs have now gotten very large and very critical, well beyond the scale that can be comfortably tackled by formal methods. There have been many failures and problems, but these have always nearly been attributable to inadequate analysis of requirements or inadequate management control. It's turned out the world just does not suffer significantly from the kind of problem that our research was intended to solve. So, a man who can live up to his own mistakes, for sure. Uh, fascinating character, you should definitely look up more about him uh, if you have the chance forward here just a little my notes. I have like seven windows open because I want to be able to keep track of things. There we go. All right. Uh, second aside, uh, Rob Pike's wife is the illustrator of Renee French, and she drew the logo for Plan 9, as mentioned earlier, which was a research uh, uh, or, um, operating system at Bell Labs, sort of seen as a follow-up to Unix. Uh, Plan 9 is named after Edward's classic sci-fi film, Plan 9 from Outer Space. And the ruler of the antagonist aliens, the ruler, is played by John Bunny Breckenridge, who Wikipedia describes as an American actor and drag queen. Look up his Wikipedia page if you want an interesting story. Here it is. It's the cutest little bunny I ever did see. Uh, I just, I, I, I had to call it out and had to show it because it's so cute. Um, and of course, she also did the logo for Go, the gopher, uh, who you've seen in lots of places. Uh, ironically, originally this gopher was designed for a fundraiser for WFMU. Small world. Let's get back to the paper. Uh, this is another quote from the paper. A major design goal of Go is to improve traditional multi-thread programming languages and make concurrent programming easier and less error prone. Um, you can probably argue a little bit about that, um, but that's the position that the paper is taking on why uh, Go exists um, for sure. The authors here are attempting to see whether or not this, this decision, this statement is true or not. Uh, and so they decide to break down the, they, what they claim is the first empirical study on Go concurrency bugs using six open source production grade Go systems, uh, Docker and Kubernetes. I think people would argue about the production grade uh, quality of Kubernetes, but you know, I, I let the point go. Uh, two data center container systems, uh, ECDD, etcd, a distributed key value store system, uh, gRPC, which is an RPC library from Google, and CockroachDB and BoltDB, both database systems. Uh, yeah, it's, is, is Kubernetes ever production grade? Who knows? Uh, they found 171 concurrency bugs in these applications, analyzed the root causes, performed experiments on them to reproduce them, and then examined the, and fixed, and examined the patches that fixed them. Uh, they then tested two existing concurrency de bug detectors um, to see if, uh, uh, if, if they could catch them, basically. Uh, the method here is not note that we're going to go through these code bases and find bugs but they're going to look at the bugs that have been found in public sources uh, and look at why, uh, how, they, how they were fixed. 
uh, and a little bit how they were found, but mostly how they were fixed. Um, so there are, you know, there's some probably some interesting, interesting decisions you have to make when you're doing that is you don't get to say, um, you have to sort of, you're relying on the quality of the community who have found bugs in the first place in order to make a reasonable decisions, which of course explains why they're going for these large, large code bases, because presumably there are more eyeballs and more eyeballs catching bugs uh, to begin with. Um, so this is their first example. And this is the first really annoying thing about this paper. Uh, the figures and the references to them uh, are very rough and uh, kind of difficult. Uh, this isn't technically Val Go code. It doesn't, would actually compile if you dropped it into a random file. Uh, it's a rewritten, extremely abbreviated version of the actual bug, which of course they did not mention the name of in the body of the paper itself. Uh, that's actually this. Uh, this is what the actual bug is. It's a bug in Kubernetes. Uh, and so the actual function is this full sort of larger thing. Uh, and the fix is the same. Like this is this is the same sort of of uh, uh, this is the same actual fix they had to make. Um, but without the, I think adding some more of the context here gives, makes it clearer sort of how the bug could have ar arisen in the first place. Um, uh, so you know, of course, some notes on the syntax here. An anonymous Go routine defined by Go Funk uh, inherits the scope of its parent. So if we're looking at that little Go Funk there on line six. Um, the result uh, is the same as the result in the um, defined in the function above, um, uh, as well as the channel. Uh, the error channel is the same as the error channel defined in the function above. The channel is the same as defined in the function above. Uh, the, the subroutine, the go routine, uh, inherits the memory, the, the references to the, anything in the parent scope. Uh, it then runs separately. Uh, it spins off. That's what the uh, the go does. It spins it off as a separate thread and lets uh, the the parent uh, continue executing. The select statement they will block until one of these cases becomes executable. But if more than one case is available to run at the moment the execution hits that point, the runtime will randomly pick one of the cases to execute. Uh, presumably this randomization is to prevent programs from becoming dependent on an implementation detail. Like if, this is basically defining undefined behavior, right? You're saying, well, anything could happen so you can't you can't rely on any part of it. Uh, this is in the same way that, uh, uh, map iteration order is explicitly undefined in Go uh, and I think technically randomized on startup. Um, uh, so you, you don't get to say, oh, I know it's always going to be this key first uh, in order to keep uh, uh, programmers from relying on particular implementation details. Because as soon as, as soon as you have an implementation detail that someone relies on, changing it is backwards incompatible. Uh, so if you look at the select statement, once the key goes back here a second, come on, come on. Uh, you can see that the I, I, this code uh, attempts to pull uh, either it's going to get a result back from the sub the uh, the go routine it fired, or we're going to get an error result back, or it's going to time out. Uh, and the bug here, the actual bug in this code, um, is that if it, if the timeout branch fires, neither the channel nor the error channel will be able to fire, and therefore this go funk will be sitting there waiting to try and send something over a channel that will never be read from. Uh, and this go routine will leak, uh, you know, as things happen, um, the, uh, uh, as this, if, as this finish request function gets called over and over and over again, if there's timeouts, it will begin leaking go routines, uh, which will never be able to be picked up. Um, switching them to buffered channels uh, means that the child go routine can still push its message onto a channel and exit, even though the parent function's already returned, um, which means that the, the orphaned channels will eventually be uh, will be uh, reaped by the garbage collector. Um, but in, uh, but there was reason before was an unbuffered channel uh, where the other end had to be uh, it would block until it was picked up correctly. You tell me, am I being told it's a typo or um, so? Yeah, the, the, you can go look at the uh, at the pull request itself to see some more context for that. Um, but that's the uh, the actual bug there is you need to switch from a unbuffered channel which will block when something tries to send to it and there's no reader to an un to a to a buffered channel which will go ahead and send and continue even if there's no one on the other end listening. So that's the sort of thing they're looking for uh, in this case. Uh, those are the sort of bugs that they're finding and analyzing and then moving forward with. I don't think the link posted uh, in the chat unfortunately where we have link turned off. Um, uh, but uh, yes, yeah, so the Golang tour breaks down how selects works as well. Golang, the Golang tour is a very good uh, introduction to Go. Uh, it's worth noting here the only way I was able to reconstruct that real code example is because all the all the data set for this uh, this paper 
are is available. Uh, they have put an Excel sheet online uh, with all of the uh, bugs and commits. Um, some of which, uh, and includes actually links to the doc, the Google Docs files where they were working out um, which uh, file, which how each bug worked and talking about it with their, I think with their advisor. Uh, I'm not sure those are actually supposed to be public. Um, so, uh, but it were actually very useful in seeing how they, how the writers of this paper were thinking about things. So you can go check that out as well. You can flip through all the bugs they found uh, and uh, sort of see some of the thinking they were doing on it. Uh, so that's the end of a section I'm going to review here. We have, a, I think we had a question about the, the randomization of select routing. Um, I just don't believe, I don't believe it's for security purposes. Uh, I mean, it may, it may have that um, side effect, but I believe it is almost entirely um, so that the Go, uh, the Go uh, developers could change the behavior um, and it not be a backwards breaking um it would not have backwards, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, backwards incompatibility, um, because there is no defined functionality that they'd be breaking. Um, and by definition, if you depend on a particular functionality that is not defined, you're the one who has the bug, not the Go compiler. Um, so I believe that's the reason they do that. Uh, it's the same for the same reason that they uh, explicitly say that um, map order is not defined and actually random so they can change the map implementation which may change the ordering uh if you're, if you're iterating over a map and that is not a, a bug in go or not a regression in go itself uh all right any other questions about section um uh, section one i don't think i saw any pass by in the stream chat but hmm. Squeak is a small talk implementation. I'm actually not sure of the history of Squeak um, as a small talk implementation. Uh, I don't think, I don't know how how much Squeak was small talk itself, um, um, but I'm not super aware of it. Uh, so I don't know the answer to that question, unfortunately. Uh, someone else asked, is it, uh, would people start relying on the select order being random then? Uh, it's not random in a useful way. Uh, I don't believe it's, I think it's, I think it's, uh, uh, I, I mean, if you try to implement a random number generator using select, I think they would just yell at you. I don't think it would work very well. Uh, and so I don't think that's a concern for the, uh, the Go team. So, all right, uh, let's go ahead and move on to section two, uh, reviewing Go concurrency primitives. Uh, this was actually uh, quite useful for me because I did not actually, although I work with Go quite a bit in my day job, I don't actually use a lot of the concurrency parts of it. Uh, I'm mostly just working on a, a, a stateless, more or less, web application. Um, so I don't need a lot of inter-process communication. I, I rely on it. Obviously, the libraries I use underneath are relying on it, but I'm not using it all that much. So this is actually a useful uh, tour for me. Uh, so I'm going to run through them as well, since this may be interesting information for folks or um, uh, that kind of thing. So we'll start with, of course, the mutex, what you might know as a mutual exclusion, exclusion lock. Uh, or it's a lock. Uh, only one process can have the lock. Any other calls trying to get the lock just block until the lock is available again. Uh, this is a, a very simple implementation of a lock, of a mutex, I should say. Uh, it's a safe counter. It has an in, it has the integer. It has a mutex. Uh, any calls to increment, grab the lock, uh, defer unlocking, increment, uh, and then print out again so I can show you when I click run that it actually does something. Uh, there's some hidden uh, actual usage code there, but for example. Uh, if you're incrementing, uh, that's actually that's that's actually a bug in my code. Uh, if you're incrementing, uh, you can't accidentally have two people call into the lock at the same call into the map at the same time. Both attempt to increment and then resave, and one of them gets squashed. Uh, so this will always be, um, you know, one, two, three, no matter what we do, even though the calls underlying it are uh, each individually threatened. Uh, so locks are pretty easy to. Locks are easy to explain and hard to reason about. Uh, it's easy to say, oh yeah, locks, very straightforward. Um, but if, of course, if you have two uh, locks that are, two threads that are, of course, locking out of order, both can suddenly find themselves waiting on the other. Um, so the read-write mutex is a read-write mutual exclusion lock, uh, which means that uh, readers can have a uh, different priority. Um, so a, a read lock can, uh, is allowed to be pulled many times, but a write lock blocks all of your accesses until that lock is released. Uh, call it, yeah, so, uh, however, in Go, as opposed to C and a number of other implementations, 
uh, a call to lock that's blocked takes priority over any other read locks uh, to make sure that a writer can break through a read a read heavy mutex. Uh, so this is not how it is in other places. In other ones, uh, I don't think it's balanced. It's weighted at all. You know, if there's seven locks waiting, one of whose are all six of whom are read locks and one's a, a write lock. Um, you know, good luck. Whoever happens to get it next gets it next. But in, that, in Go, the 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 main lock will always beat the other six uh, read locks, uh, which apparently can lead to occasional bugs uh, for people who are not aware of that difference. Uh, here's an example of a read write mutex. Uh, uh, and you can see here, it's, you know, it, it as opposed to just the increment that we had before, we now have a value, which allows us to do reading. We use the R lock there as opposed to just the lock. We could implement this model with just a, uh, with just the standard mutex, um, but uh, value does not mutate. And so we don't mind that many people are reading at the same time. We only would care that only one person can write at the same time. And we can run that uh, and we get the same value back out. However, if we're lucky, I may see this occasionally would run out of order in my, yep, there it is. Oh, missed it. Um, because the code that does this uh, does a, a, a increment and then a value read. Uh, and so those, of course, release the lock in between. And so it is possible to have a uh, increment fire and then the value fires. Uh, and in between, it's lost the lock. Someone else has grabbed the lock. There it is. Yeah, so this increment value has, of course, happened out of order. Um, not a bug in this case, um, but it is interesting to look at. So even though you're using locks and like, oh, yeah, I can increment and I can read the value back out, you're not necessarily going to get back out the value you thought, even though you're using locks in a way that seems reasonable. Um, so mistakes all over the place. Conditional variables, uh, aka cond, are built around a mutex. It adds a weight and broadcast. Uh, this one's a little hard to explain. Uh, I am still entirely sure that I've got it right here. But um, the idea is you have a mutex. Is that a write, unlock, read, pattern, common? Um, it's, it is in libraries, I think, are you, uh, you know, where you have a, uh, a counter that's safe. Um, uh, but you're not necessarily guaranteed to maintain the lock between uh, the question in the chat is, is that right unlock read pattern common? Uh, I think it is because if, if a lock is hidden from you, you have no control over how it does this sort of work. Uh, of course, if the, if the, if the lock is, is, if you're the one who controls how the lock is handled in your own code, you could say, well, I'm going to lock the whole thing, increment, read the value back out and then unlock. Um, but then of course you're not hiding away the sort of, the, it's not hidden inside the safe counter anymore. It's you're having to do your own lock management. Uh, so it really comes down to what kind of patterns and what kind of libraries you're using. Uh, conditional variables are built around a mutex. It adds the weight and broadcast concepts. Uh, so a conditional uh, takes a mutex, takes a lock. Um, and I, I, I'm gonna see if I can explain this correctly. So you, uh, the main process get, pulls the lock, fires off, uh, creates a new conditional, fires off a go, uh, 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 go routine, um, does some initialization, and then calls wait, which releases the lock and blocks until broadcast is called. The, and meanwhile, the uh, go routine um, blocks until, until wait is called and then can get the lock. Uh, it does a change to that shared V, which of course, remember, is past is uh, shared memory between the main routine and the, uh, and the subroutine here because uh, a def an anonymous uh, Go routine picks up uh, its parent's uh, memory. Uh, it fires off broadcast to let the waiters know that we're done and then unlocks. Uh, once these things have fired off, uh, the wait unlocks because it hit, it heard broadcast. It fires off its own print line and then it unlocks itself to match this lock. Uh, if we run this, I don't think it'll look very interesting because it'll print out one. Um, uh, but that is what is going on there. Is it uh, the uh, and it, it, it's the uh, a sort of nested locks where a, uh, someone who has a lock can temporarily give it up and then uh, will reclaim it afterwards. Um, so yeah, this you know note the parent thread never never um, called unlock before uh, the uh, the go routine was able to, but the go routine was still able to uh, to grab the lock and then unlock again afterwards. So. As you can tell from the one I, the way I've described it there, uh, this is relatively complicated to use, and so it's easy to accidentally get it wrong.
there's not actually a lot of usage of, con uh, of conditional variables in the uh, examples that they use. And it may be a sign of, um, uh, of maybe some of the unpopularity there. Uh, conditional can be, uh, as my notes also say, con, uh, con can be confusing because it's a semaphore, you know, for marking that something condition, some condition has been reached, but it doesn't itself maintain that condition. Um, so, you know, you know, we don't pass, you know, the value we're interested in, the V, this, this around, but we just say, oh, you know, you can now do something. You can now do something. Someone else should go try and get the lock. Uh, so. Once is a Go construct that provides a function will be called once. It's very simple. <laughs> uh, this is a very simple function. It, it, the idea is any function you pass to a once will be run once. However, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, it doesn't matter what function you give. You could give different functions each time you call once, but the fact uh, the or the do, um, but the do will only execute whatever it's given once. You could you know I can run this. And hey, instead of it, it tries to do the loop ten times, but in fact only outputs once and then uh, completes. Uh, so we never see uh, anything else uh, going on. You see a bunch of channel stuff I'm doing here too. Uh, this is so that I can uh, I can wait for the all the sub function all the go routines to finish before the parent ends. Uh, if the parent function ends, if the parent routine ends before the uh, uh, subroutines do, uh, they all just get killed. Uh, there is still a parent. Uh, routine. Uh, you can't have an internally eternally running uh, Go subroutine will not uh, keep the entire process alive. Um, so there's some magic you have to do here in order to block so that you can uh, wait and make sure that all the Go routines are finished before you actually go ahead and finish off your work. Um, this is not the same as memoization. Uh, do does not return a value. It does not uh, you know, notice what's come in and, and run it and then remember what the result was. This is just like, no, you get to run the thing. This this thing can only be run once. All our, all our calls to do will be a null op uh, and do nothing. Um, but I, you know, we could have changed this function to have it some sort of incrementer or anything like that. Or, you know, the second time it's run, print only twice, wouldn't matter. Uh, or a different function every time, for example. Doesn't matter, do can only run once. And then finally, uh, wait group, which is, a way to make that last thing I did a lot easier. Instead of having to do all that channel hooking up and managing around, we can say, no, no, no. We're going to have a wait group. We're going to have 10 functions. We're going to keep adding one to the wait group every time we create a Go routine. Uh, we're going to wait for all the Go routines to finish to tell the Go group that it's done, and then we're going to finish. So this is very similar to the last one. Uh, we, run we run this, and we start all our Go routines. Each one prints out which Go routine it is, and then quits, and then the whole thing quits. Uh, note here that the numbers are completely random order. Uh, go routines can be arbitrarily scheduled by the scheduler. Um, so in this case, um, you know, it came out and it happened that, that you know the go routine scheduler fired them off in this order, and then it, we, we were finished. Um, but it did manage to get here before any of them managed to print. Uh, if we run this again, the output is totally different. Uh, so it is completely, uh, completely arbitrary for the scheduler when go routines run in relation to the main thread. Um, I think I've even seen it where nine was the first one I completed. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, they are separate routines are not related to the parent in any way. Uh, you'll also note, uh, one little fun thing here is I had to say, I, uh, in this go routine, uh, and pass in the, uh, the parent from the four. This seems like it shouldn't be necessary because why don't you just let the, you know, let the shared memory, you know, do its thing and say, okay, you know, you're know, you gonna take I and then you'll run I in here and it'll be fine. Um, but if you try and do that, because as I mentioned, the Go routine makes, the process makes, it, Go makes it here before any of the Go routines actually manage to uh, execute. And so uh, from the point of view of the Go routines, their I's are all equal to 10 because the loop has finished. Uh, and so if you actually do that, and it's a common bug, if you say that the go func doesn't take any options, but instead just relies on the parent memory, uh, this, instead of having you know zero through nine, it just says nine the entire time. All of them get the exact same input. And this is actually one of the bugs that's discussed later on in the paper. All right, so that's on to section three. So does anyone have any other questions about section two and the sort of all the various, all the various you know, shared memory uh, models available to uh, someone working in 
a uh, in Go. Uh, channels themselves are sort of uh, gone over earlier. Uh, you can push a, a model on something onto a channel, uh, and the value comes back out the other end, either buffered or unbuffered. Uh, and someone in the comments notes that even better access to I isn't synchronized at all, so it's just a straight up data race. Uh, so yes, that's exactly what's going on there. Your, your shared memory, and so anyone can be writing, anyone can be reading. It's complete nonsense. And they also note, uh, when conditional variables were invented alongside uh, mutexes and threads, the inventors of them thought they were creating primitives that anyone could use. They'd be so easy. Uh, it, you know, they'd solve everyone's problems, and it'd be great. Uh, and in fact, they're extremely complicated and hard to reason about sometimes. So, All right, any further questions about the shared memory patterns? Twitch chat emojis, I do not understand. Excellent. All right, let me flip through my notes, make sure I've covered everything I wanted to cover. Ah, one of the things to note um, is in the example for once, which is taken straight from um, the Go, uh, the documentation for the Go Sync library with a couple of tweaks for clarity here, um, it's of course using channels all over the place as well. Um, the Go documentation and libraries do not treat concurrency models as an either or proposition. Um, the Go, the developers of Go and the, and the writers of the compiler and all that don't see it as you must be using shared memory and locks or you must use channels and you know, locks are bad. It's, you know, you do what you need to do to get to solve the problem you're working on. They're not mutually exclusive concepts in Go. Um, you know, the, the interplay of locks and channels is uh, both very common and also a source of, of confusion and bucks as this paper sort of uh, breaks down in some detail. All right, usage patterns. So let's talk about that break it down in some detail. Quote, overall, the six applications use a large amount of Go routines, which well, I'd hope so since you guys picked them to do a paper about, Go, about the usage of Go routines. Uh, and you look at that and you go, uh, well, I have I have questions about Bolt DB because I don't know about you, but I feel like two is not a large number of Go routines. Even though, of course, but you know, per thousand per thousand lines of code, which is what per uh, K lock means there, uh, it's not it's not that far off from uh, Kubernetes. Uh, you know, it uh, that, uh, apparently means that Kubernetes has a uh, hundred times as much code as Bolt DB does. Um, so I don't know if really that's a useful metric to be looking at here, because uh, clearly BoltDB sees very little use in Go routines um, as creation sites anyway. And it doesn't. It, this is just purely the number of places where a uh, uh, a Go routine is created. Uh, it's not where it's used or something or sent over a channel. It's purely uh, the place uh, where a Go routine is is um, is created. Um, so this is interesting. Uh, I was going to note that uh, uh, BoltDB has been archived as of May 2018. Uh, it ha development, however, does continue uh, under the auspices of the uh, etcd um, uh, group. I think it's now called bbolt, perhaps bboltdb. Uh, so it is still around. Um, uh, it, this this paper was written in it was released in 2019, but I believe uh, it's, I seem like some of the work was probably done before uh, quite a bit before that. Uh, probably back, I think some of the graphs cut off in twenty uh, in twenty eighteen. So it's entire. Yeah, there we go. The link at etcdio slash bbolt uh, is the current home of the code base formerly known as boltdb. Um, so yeah, uh, Kubernetes obviously he has much more use, uh, much higher usage of uh, Go routines and thread creation. Uh, than everywhere else, but it's it's interesting uh, the breakdown here at uh, etcd has many more anonymous Go routines than normal normal uh, Go routines, that kind of thing. Uh, interesting chart. Um, uh, it's not immediately clear how this is related to their overall thesis, um, but it's an interesting chart to sort of see how they're doing things. They also include at the bottom uh, the gRPC-C, which is an implementation of uh, gRPC in C as opposed to the one in Go, maintained by the same teams at Google, I believe. Um, they're including this here to sort of make the point that um, G, uh, that Go threads are much more, Go, Go routines are much more common than C threads are, um, which 
makes sense. Uh, it's very easy to create a Go Go routine. They're very they're much they're much lighter weight, much less overhead conceptually anyway than threads. Um, so it makes more sense that people who are writing Go code from scratch are going to use um, uh, Go routines. The you know, runtime in, in, sort of implies you should be doing that versus C where it says a choice you can make. So uh, they also note in their uh, in in their discussion of the C versus Go part that they found they 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 measured how long each thread um, would uh, would existed for in the life of the program. Uh, most Go routines uh, do not exist for very long over the course of an entire run cycle, um, but quote we found all threads in gRPC C execute from the beginning to the end of the entire program, uh, i.e. one hundred percent. Uh, which implies to me that the C threads and the Go routines are doing different things. Um, you know, it, it 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 just makes it sound like they're comparing apples and oranges in ways that are not particularly interesting uh, as actual conceptual breakdowns on the uh, for the paper, and they don't really play around with this idea any further. So I'm not entirely sure why they bothered uh, developing it at this point in the paper. Oh, and here's them talking about that. Yeah, these implies to me that these are serving just purely different functions. Um, you know, if, if threads were being created the same at the same rate as uh, Go routines, it might make sense to uh, compare them. Um, but since they're being created at different rates, ex exist for different uh, time periods, and um, and sort of it, it just seems obvious that you 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 haven't found anything interesting by comparing these two things that are completely different, even though they're both you know sub processes in some sense. So those observations seem to me pretty pretty cheap. Uh, and not particularly valuable. Uh, figures two and three are fun because if you look at them, uh, they're identical. Uh, they're both percentages of each other. So the usage of shared memory primitives over time versus the usage of shared a message packing primitive over time, if there's only those two ways you can do it, then those are the same graph. Great job. <laughs> Again, it's probably an interesting way to break down data. Um, uh, and it is interesting that the usage more or less stays stable over time uh, with uh, etcd being a particular, you see the drop off there. Um, but again, I'm not sure what exactly um, they've, they've, what they think they're showing us when they show us these two graphs. Um, there's little comment given them on the paper. Um, and uh, it just kind of, you know, it just kind of it just kind of mentioned and then move they move on. Um, so we continue moving on ourselves, which leads us to their first implication. With heavier usage of Go routines and new types of concurrency premises, is the time count on the bottom? Yes, uh, that is uh, it is a map of. Um, it's kind of hard to read in this shot, but it's I believe it's year and month. So uh, the beginning is twenty fifteen, uh, and the end is twenty eighteen. Uh, fe February. February, May, July, November. Yeah, it's so it's 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 quarterly, starting in February, uh, stepping through. Yeah, 2018. Uh, the, so yeah, the, the the paper ends in that. So right before, right before Bolt DB with archive, in fact. So implication one: with heavier uses of Go routines and new types of concurrency premises, Go programs may potentially introduce more concurrency bugs. So the actual paper they're interested, the actual question they're interested in answering in the paper. Uh, are there any questions about sort of their, their laying out of their uh, their usage patterns data or anything like that? Um, I don't think so. It's a pretty short little section they went they went through there. I don't think I think I answered the questions that we were going. So just check the chat. How many people we got here anyway? Oh hey, pretty good turnout. And we have people saying that both DB had some concurrency issues last time it was used. So. Well, there definitely are. There were definitely were some bugs they found in it uh, that had been fixed. So, now let's talk a little bit about methodology. So, the way they found their bugs was to collect concurrency bugs. We filtered GitHub commit histories of the first six applications by searching their commit logs for concurrency related keywords: race, deadlock, synchronization, concurrency, lock, mutex, atomics, compete. Context once, which probably get you some uh, a couple of false positives and go routine leak. 
Some of these keywords are used in previous works. Some of them are related to new concurrency primitives. One of them, Go routine leak, is related to a special problem in Go, as mentioned on the like, very first example. They found 3,211 distinct commits that were matched this criteria. They then randomly sampled the filter commits, identified commits that fix concurrency bugs, and then manually studied them. Now, many bug commits, you know, many bug related commit blogs also mention the corresponding bug reports. In this case, that would be the uh, the issue, like a GitHub issue. And we studied these reports for our bug analysis. They studied 171 concurrency bugs in total. And they mention here they only studied bugs that have been fixed. There could have been other concurrency bugs that have really reproduced and have never been fixed by developers. And for some fixed concurrency bugs, there was too little information provided, making them hard to understand. These bugs have been excluded from the study. This prompts a couple of questions for me, one of which is why are you randomly sampling and then identifying if they're actually concurrency bugs? I, I, perhaps this is merely a, a problem of volume. I have, you know, you know 2,700 uh, bugs is uh, a lot of bugs. Just have to sort of sit through, sift through to find the one, or 3,200 uh, bugs uh, and commits a lot to sift through. So sampling them and then doing some sorting uh, may just purely be a, a, a level of, you know, we didn't have the manpower to do anything more. Um, the lifetime graph in section four implies that they're both classes of bug, you know, they mentioned uh, the classes of bugs all last for about the same time, uh, both mutex and channels. So there's not a lot of sort of value there. Um, there is a question of, you know, are all bugs evenly distributed? Like, is it possible that, you know, when they, you know, when a product first introduced, you know, a channel, there were a bunch of bugs about it. So they only, they only managed to, you know, catch one of those in their random sampling. Um, it's just a weird, it just strikes me as an odd thing to do if you have, if you have a, a finite set of data, why not use all of it? But it's what they did. So they had 171 bugs between the six, um, the six uh, applications. Um, it's also a little unclear the relationship between the bugs they found and the uh, concurrent, the primitive, the primitives data usage data earlier. I believe they are on, they are unrelated. They they develop their usage data separately from analyzing the bugs themselves. Uh, all right, that's all they really have to say about methodology. Uh, I have some questions, but you know, it's just kind of we have the we have the paper we 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 talk about the paper we have, not the paper we want. So. The report on which bugs selected, if so, it might be more interesting to trend over timelines, more useful than memory usage. The report on which, I'm not sure what you mean. Oh, there's a question in the chat. Did they report on which bugs selected? Um, I, they just said it was selected randomly and they do they do provide, as I mentioned, the Excel sheet with all the different commits of the ones they looked at um, in their repo, uh, which was you know linked earlier. Uh, so if you want to re go review which ones I actually used, you can go look at every single one of them. Uh, there's links to both the commit and the related pull request or issue um, from the uh, from the very the four the six repos. So if you're curious, you can go see them. I've pulled out their examples here as well uh, with links. So speaking of which, let's just dive straight into some of the blocking bugs. Um, so here we go. Quotes. Overall, we found that there are about. 42% blocking bugs caused by errors in protecting shared memory, but in 58% caused by errors in message passing. Considering that message, mes shared memory primitives are used much more frequently than message passing ones, message passing operations are the even more likely to cause blocking bugs. Therefore, contrary to the common belief that message passing is less error prone, more blocking bugs in our study op Go applications are caused by wrong message passing than by wrong shared memory protection. You know, all right, good, you know, They've 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 proved the case. You know, good job. Everyone go go out go out for a round of beers. This is the big takeaway the paper got some traction for when it came out. Basically, everyone's saying, "Hey, Go designers make a really big game about how much better and safer their language is because of channels." But really, it's worse. Look at them. They they try to pull one over on us those Google hacks. But no, we know better. Or we'll go back to C and you know our threads and. Rah. Uh, I mean, everyone loves a story about how conventional wisdom or some hot new thing is wrong. The paper hit just as Go really seemed to be sort of, I, I feel like it was really taking off mindshare-wise among sort of broader community. That might just be, you know, my own experiences or my own uh, biases. But it does feel like it was sort of, it came out right as there was sort of a nice peak of everyone. Everyone was writing the why we're switching to Go blog posts, I think, right as this, as this, as this paper came out as well. So good timing on their part, really. 
Um, it's, it's, I, I think there's some debate you can have over whether or not they have actually proven their point, their thesis here. Um, and I'm waiting for my slides to catch up. There we go. Okay, so let's actually look at some of the data they, the, uh, some of the, the tables they have here. Um, tables four and table five break down um, the percentages of, this is, now, now we're not just looking at um, usage in general, but usage in the bugs. Um, I think they're shaving their numbers a bit thinly here. If you look at, for example, um, you know, the shared memory block versus the message block. Well, yes. Um, oh no, this is this is just usage. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm misquoting. The fifth one is bugs. The fourth one is purely usage. Uh, it's unclear to me at what point they took this snapshot. Um, like, is this you know the snapshot of the code at uh, in, in 2015, is this 2018? Uh, that's totally unmentioned in the code, in the paper, when they took these snapshots of usages, usage percentages. Um, uh, mutex usage dominates, um, for sure, across all of these applications. Um, et, 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 uh, etcd is, a slight, is slightly different. There's more usage of uh, once there than anywhere else. There's more usage of channels there than anywhere else. Um, but across most, you know, for most of the applications, mute, you know, locks uh, are by far the most popular, and then channels are the second most popular. Uh, there's not a huge amount of um, of disagreement there. Uh, for within the bugs, of course, we have uh, breaking down behavior and cause, um, but not necessarily cross tabulating those. Uh, you know, the fact that there's you know 21 and 23 uh, blocking versus non blocking is not necessarily related to the number of shared memory versus memory passing bugs. Um, so I, I, I feel like the numbers here of actual bugs they looked at mean you can't draw huge conclusions. Uh, it feels like they're a very thinly shaving um, uh, their, their numbers. For example, uh, overall shared memory misprotection can contribute to more bugs in memory passage, but a hair over 60% analyzed bugs, uh, but it's used more often, of course, like, you know, new checks are much more popular. Um, so it's, 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 and of course the channel of the fudge of channel with other, uh, there's other things going on in there. So, you know, a bug is, is very rarely, if you look at their descriptions, uh, purely a use, uh, is, is often not just a, uh, a random sampling of bug commits, right? There's, there's definitely a question of, of how valid is the underlying data, I think, um, which is hard to sort of, uh, prove entirely. Uh, and also their description, their use of blocking versus non-blocking uh, is sort of an interesting, uh, interesting sort of philosophical problem for me. Uh, it sounds like a difference in severity when you actually read it, um, but it's hard to say that blocking bugs are more important uh, or more serious than non-blocking bugs. For example, our Go routines never block. Our system's always available, but the data rates is, and, and the results in every checking account being processed by the application silently using a penny on every transaction. You know, it, it that's a non, that's a non-blocking bug. Uh, but it's it's much worse than oh the uh, the subroutines uh, have a tendency to to uh, block each other. Uh, would you rather crash or would you rather lose a penny on every transaction? You know, it's an interesting question. So it, it, there are some interesting decisions made here. Uh, they do pull out some examples. Uh, this is Figure Five. Uh, it's from uh, which which code base is this from? Now that I've said that. This is from Docker, um, now known as Moby, of course. Um, which is no, no, no. Don't don't ask me to explain why that what what that means. Uh, this is a bug in Docker. Uh, it's a very simple bug. We do this whole big range thing over a list of plugins. You fire off an entire Go routine, and then you wait. Unfortunately, you need to wait after you've done all the work, not while you're doing the work. Uh, that's the entirety of the bug. Uh, this works great for a zero or one plugin. Uh, once you have two plugins, however, uh, the range freezes because it's already added two here. Uh, it then needs to wait for two calls to done. Uh, but unfortunately, only one Go routine has been created with a call to done. Uh, therefore, the wait will never will will block if you have more than two if you have more than one plugin installed. Uh, the simple this fix is very simple: move the wait down two lines and outside of the for loop. Uh, it's a simple bug fix. Yeah, as mentioned, it blocks. It works fine. The zero one cases and blocks forever in the one the one plus n case. Um, they have handled everything else correctly. Uh, so it's 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 hard to call this a bug. It's caused by some misapprehension of how the system works. This is 
you know, it's it's just a mistake. Um, but again, of course, you have, I assume most bugs are not caused by someone misunderstanding how things work, but just simply accidentally doing it. The conditional variable and thread group weight are both traditional concurrency techniques. We suspect Go's new programming model to be one of the reasons why programmers make these concurrency bugs. For example, unlike pthread join, which is a functional call that explicitly waits on the completion of named threads, weight group is a variable that can be shared across Go routines. Its weight function implicitly waits for the done function. I just don't understand how this is related to the problem that we saw in the example. The programmer hasn't, you know, maybe it would be easier, it would be harder for them to make a mistake if they had to enumerate all the threads and then realize, oh, but I don't have all the names yet at this point. Um, but I don't think that they're misunderstanding what they're trying to do here. Uh, they just didn't put it in the right place because probably because they didn't have all, the, they weren't paying attention when they wrote that function. Um, which, you know, fair is, it, it's maybe a, uh, an issue with the Go program, uh, with the program or the language that you have, it's easy for you to make that mistake by accident. Uh, in this code here, um, we have a different, a different misuse of, um, uh, or this is actually just ex uh, showing off the example in a slightly different way. Uh, it's even possible to do this and not have a block, but still do it wrong. Uh, if you have a weight group, you have a range and you add one inside the range and then wait, uh, you don't, of course, get any of the benefits of having uh, 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 go, uh, go routines firing. You wait, 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 wait. And you correctly, of course, done. You wait, and then you do everything, and then you're done. Um, it just found this interesting that it would be possible to do, it would be possible to have this bug exist and, e and have it even harder to find. Uh, this bug would probably never be caught um, because it, it doesn't cause incorrect behavior, just maybe slightly in, a slight uh, decrease in performance. Uh, in a way that's not exactly obvious to most people. Uh, so I just found that an interesting thing I was playing around with as I was reading the paper. I was like, what are some other ways that you can do this? Um, so as mentioned, uh, it's hard to call this a big bug. It's, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's an obvious easy mistake. It's well understood, but hard to catch when your eyes are skimming over the code for the business logic and not necessarily the concurrency piece. Uh, and now they want to talk about message passing. We just now discussed blocking bugs caused by errors in message passing, which the, which the contrary con belief are the main type of blocking bugs in our studied applications. So their assertion is blocking bugs are in fact most often caused by message passing mistakes. Like this one. Uh, this is this one's so simple. In fact, they didn't have to reformat it even. This is straight out of the out of the bug uh, out of the FTD uh, pull request. Uh, and it's a bug in the context library. Uh, so in this case, uh, the original code uh, simply called with cancel. If it was header timeout, it instead called with timeout and then called the cancel function. However, uh, when you do that, uh, you have abandoned the original cancel you created. Uh, and that channel is just going to sit there and, and, and forever. It will never have anything write to it, never have anything read to it, but it'll always um, be left open, so you'll leak, you'll leak channels that way. As long as you're, if you're, if you're providing timeouts, if you're not providing timeouts, you won't. Otherwise, so the correct way to do this is to actually just create uh, empty variables for contact and cancel function, create a timeout function, or create a cancel function, and then uh, defer the cancel uh, down the road. Of course, you can call, um, you can call the. Uh, that the timeouts cancel if you actually get a cancel coming down the road as well. Um, and when combining the Go special libraries, channel creation and Go routine blocking may be buried inside library calling. Like, there's no op there, there's no arrows in this code, right? You're not you don't think about how the fact you're creating channels when you do it. But as shown in Figure Six, a new context object H cancel is created on line one. A new Go routine is created at the same time, and the message can be sent to the new Go routine through the channel field of H cancel. But if timeout that is larger than zero, line four to the context object is created and H cancels pointing to the new object. After that, there's no way to send messages to, to or close the go routine attached to the old object. The patch avoids creating the extra context object when the timeout is larger than zero. The go documentation in fact mentions uh, failing to call a cancel function leaks the child and its parent until the parent is canceled or the timer files. The go vet tool checks that cancel functions are used on all control flow paths. So it even mentions that the child that it will leak if you do this incorrectly in the documentation. So figure seven, I couldn't find the original four. 
Um, this one, I could not figure out which uh, what uh, code base they had uh, trimmed down to the point where it, to uh, incoherence. Um, but it is a block. Uh, instead of simply uh, in GoRoutine 1, having a lock, then attempting to send a request over a channel, and then unlocking. And over in GoRoutine 2, uh, doing an uh, eternal loop, which locks, uh, attempts to read off the channel and then unlock. I assume there's supposed to be a defer here, um, because that's the only way this makes any sense. <laughs> um, you should instead attempt to send or default do nothing uh, in the first GoRoutine. Uh, the, uh, yeah, uh, GoRoutine 1 attempts to send a request from the channel while holding the lock. GoRoutine 2 attempts to grab the lock and then read from the channel. Neither can proceed. The addition of the empty select lets GoRoutine 1 proceed past the send in the case of a block, unlocking the locks so that channel two, Go channel can itself receive something. And this may just be me under, not mis, mis, misunderstanding what's going on here, but this does change the behavior of the program. The select will now opt to skip sending a message on the blocked channel in the fixed version, and GoRoutine 2 will now block trying to read from the channel. Whether it's acceptable or not in the context of the program is left as an exercise to the reader. I don't fully understand it. The, discussion, the description in the paper is, the fix is to add a select with default branch for GoRoutine 1 to make channel not block anymore. I don't fully get it. I, I mean, if, if someone else would like to explain to me fully what this is doing in the comments, feel free. But this is so pared down, it's it's not particularly understandable in my in, to me. And being able to find the original commit makes it even harder. Uh, to fully grok what this is supposed to actually be doing. Um, so, uh, so they have they finish all this off with an observation. However, all blocking bugs caused by message passing are related to Go's new message passing semantics like channel. Well, that makes sense because the only way you can do message passing in Go is by channel. Uh, so, of course, all the blocking bugs that are caused by message passing are related to the channels. Uh, they can be difficult to detect, especially when in message passing operations are used together with other synchronous mechanisms. That makes sense. That's fine. But the first sentence seems like a tautology to me, which is unpleasant. <laughs> Pull my notes forward here. So that's them. That's our discussion of blocking bugs. Um, does anyone have any questions? Any thoughts on that? Uh, I'm watching the chat. I don't see anything. Uh, if anyone has, does anyone have any thoughts on uh, what this is supposed to be doing? If not, I'll take your emails later too. Or you can join the Slack and tell me later and tell me how I totally missed the obvious thing this is supposed to be doing. Uh, and I'd be I'd, I'd love to hear it because I'm it, it's still kind of puzzling to me even after looking at it for quite a while. But I don't see anything in the chat, so we'll go ahead and move on to the non-blocking bug section. Figure eight. This is the bug I was talking about when I first introduced um, uh, some of the mutexes of variables and anonymous, anonymous go routines are shared with the parent unless shadowed by a function argument. Um, it's shared memory. It doesn't look like shared memory, but it's totally shared memory. Um, so this is another bug in Docker. This is actually a bug in the tests in Docker. Uh, it's not actually a bug in Docker's runtime code. This is a bug in a validation function to make sure that uh, various uh, outputs of the API version were doing the right thing. Uh, in the buggy version, it just checked that 21 was present all the time. In the correct version, it should check that 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 are, are present. Um, so as mentioned, this is what the buggy version looks like. If you do this wrong, it spits out 10 the entire time as opposed to what you might expect, which is 1 through 10, or 0 through 10 in this case. Um, so actually, you'd expect 0 through 9 is actually a, uh, a bug in my own bug, in my own code. Uh, so. You know, shared variable, mem shared variable mem access is shared memory. Uh, that's kind of what it means. We need enough pointers anyway. Uh, we have another one here, Figure Nine, uh, which is trimmed down a little bit. From, this is still bigger than the version in the code in the paper, but this is still trimmed down to fill on the screen. Uh, it's again misplacing the uh, the add to a, a wait group uh, instead of doing it inside the Go func, uh, which would allow for it to escape. Uh, uh, I'll wait later. You do want to you want to do the add before you uh, before you execute the um, the go routine. Uh, why is this necessary? Because go routines can be arbitrarily scheduled. While the entire send function is inside a critical section and has the lock, the go routine that you create is outside the lock. It escapes from the critical section and can run it every time, even after the lock's been released. And as such, send can fire, and then stop might run. Correctly grab the lock, 
check if anything's available, check it should stop, um, shut everything down, and then you know, and then it and then it'll wait. Um, uh, all before the all before uh, the uh, go routine that was created gets a chance to run at all. Uh, this is actually a bug in etcd. Uh, presumably, uh, this is and this is a little interesting as well because this was actually found not as part of a bug report, but as part of a larger refactoring they were doing to their um, their uh, Pax. I believe it was a Paxos implementation. Uh, so this never actually made it into a deployed and you know released code. This was you know part of a larger package of commits they were doing. That, you know, as the team was working, they found that they hadn't done it correctly in the first commit. Uh, you know, and they fixed it in a second secondary commit. So again, is 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 that a fair uh, you know, bug in, bug in a public code? Eh, yes, I suppose it is, since someone made a mistake and then went back and fixed it. Um, but it's not, it's not the same sort of thing as, you know, this was a public bug report that was filed and fixed. So, uh, you know, if, if somebody went through all my code uh, and found every intermediate step, I'm sure there'd be lots of bugs that I, I, I feel like I hadn't made in some sense. So it's interesting. All right, come on, there we go. And so they make some observations about non-blocking bugs as well. Uh, about two thirds of shared memory non-blocking bugs are caused by traditional causes. Go's new multi-thread semantics and new libraries contribute to the rest of the further one third. Um, uh, implication five, new programming models and new libraries that Go introduced, like context, to ease multi-thread programming can themselves be the reasons of more concurrency bugs. Called it. Called it right there. I have a complaint. More concurrency bugs? There's no evidence in this paper that any of these non-blocking bugs or any of these bugs in general wouldn't have happened even if they weren't using channels, and even if channels weren't in the language at all, and that everything had been implemented using locks and traditional memory patterns instead. Just because these bugs occur because they're using channels doesn't imply that the channels are the cause of the bugs. And that's, I think, the problem I have with this paper in the end. I think I might be okay with some of these conclusions I come to if they'd done more work to tease out exactly that the programmers who committed these mistakes had misunderstood the models they were using, or that the bugs had been introduced, or if they found where the bugs had been introduced, where they were fit instead of fixed, which might provide more insight into how people were thinking about things during the causes and creation of these bugs. But all the data they have here is a set of bug fixes and they're only the bugs that somebody found, not all the possible bugs. Um, and this just kind of, it, 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 it's a major flaw of the paper in my mind. Um, what else could have been done here? I mean, they could have had programmers implement parallel algorithm, you know, this algorithm in two different ways, using traditional pr primitives and channels to see if they made similar kinds of mistakes. Uh, they could have worked with these projects. So I don't think there was any discussion with the various projects that they were going to be tested on. Uh, you know, examined in this way to see what the experience of working with the primitives are like. Um, they observe this in the, in the in this fixes section coming forward. Traditional shared memory synchronization techniques remain to be remain to be the main fixes for non-blocking bugs in Go. Well, channel is used widely not to fix only channel-related bugs, but also shared memory bugs. Um, so Go programmers, when confronted with a concurrency bug, reach for channel as opposed to have reaching for shared traditional memory synchronization. Uh, so Go programmers, people who are actually working day to day in the language, definitely think and definitely act as if channels are indeed safer. Um, it, I mean, it could just be a general like hallucination of all Go programmers that this is true. Um, but I, I, you know, I find that people stop doing things. People don't do things that actually cause them harm. Um, so they mention here, you know, while Go programmers continue to use shared memory protection mechanisms to fix non-blocking bugs, they prefer to use message passing as a fix in certain cases, possibly because they view messages passing as safer to ways to communicate across threads. They don't interrogate that thought any farther, they're just kind of guessing. Um, so this, this this is really the problem I have in the end with the paper is that it, 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 it doesn't fully sort of get there on proving its main thesis. It's, it has some interesting data and has some interesting examples, um, but it doesn't back up the the sort of it doesn't it doesn't manage to prove that to, to to get to the counter example and say this is this is why it's happening uh they mentioned earlier on in the paper the threats to validity of our study could come from many aspects we select at select representative go applications there are many other applications implemented in go and they may not share the same concurrency problems they study bugs that have been fixed there are others that may not be found 
And for some of these bugs, we don't understand them. There's too little information provided. We do not include these bugs in our study. Despite these limitations, we've had our best efforts in collecting real-world Go concurrency bugs and concluding a comprehensive and unbiased study. We believe our findings are, are general enough to motivate and guide further research on fighting Go concurrency bugs. Okay, I suppose. I'm, I'm glad this paper exists. I just don't know if it has really some of the predictive power they kind of hoped it did. Uh, but with that sort of set aside, um, they do talk in these sections also a little, I'm gonna skip over the last couple uh, non-blocking message passing bugs because they're just not that interesting. Uh, if you're interested, you can read the paper, you can look at them, you can find the original uh, uh, links, you know, figure out which they're, the projects are originally from. Uh, the last thing I do wanna talk about is their discussion of concurrency bug detection in Go, uh, which is interesting. Uh, someone in the comments says, would their thesis be better expressed as using concurrency is harder than not using concurrency? Uh, I think that's definitely, <laughs> that's, I mean, I don't think you need a paper to talk to say that. I think a lot, of, I think many people would vote for the idea uh, that concurrency is harder than uh, sequential programming. Uh, but it definitely sometimes feels like it may boil down to that. So uh, yeah, let's talk about detection. Like how can you find these things other than just staring at code? Uh, so deadlocks, Go has a deadlock detector. Um, oh, someone else has a question here. Why did Go developers choose to make sending on a channel with no surviving receivers block forever? It seems like a cause of a lot of leaks. Um, because sometimes you want the block. Um, you know, sometimes you want to say, you know, I have a pool of 10 uh, Go routines that pull off this channel and do things. Uh, and I want the, you know, something that's writing into that, that pool to not stick a bunch of, to only have something go into that pool. I don't want the channel to fill up forever. I don't want the channel, I want to have back pressure. I don't want to have the channel fill up a billion items uh, because that implies my memory is running out of control. There are reasons for blocking channels. Um, I think there it, it are plenty of, plenty of architectural reasons why you would want a blocking channel. Um, you know, Squeak and New Squeak as mentioned only had blocking channels. Uh, someone else points out, it's very hard to prove that no one could ever receive it later. Um, yeah, how would you stop uh, someone, how would you, if you, once all receivers have been garbage collected, wouldn't it make sense to unblock remaining receivers? Um, that feels like a bug as well. If I I expect that this will be sent to somebody, and if I un if it gets sent into the ether, you know that's also a problem. I think it, it, there's definitely points in which it makes sense. I think to have um, um, to have receivers, you can add receivers at any time as well. Like if if, if there's a reference to the channel somewhere, you can't know for sure that that'll be a reader off of it again. Uh, so it's an interesting problem, but I think I think there's good reasons for uh, blocking channels to exist in Go. Um, but let's talk about deadlocks. Just for last, Go has a deadlock detector. Let's just use it. It doesn't work. <laughs> well, no, it does work. It, it does work. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. Unfortunately, the deadlock detector defines a deadlock extremely narrowly. Um, you know, it, it mentions there's 21. Uh, they tried. Uh, a bunch of bugs uh, that they could reproduce easily uh, against the deadlock detector. It found two of them out of 21. Uh, and of course, the reason for this is the deadlock detector is built into the scheduler and can only detect when all Go routines are blocked from continuing. If even one routine can still make progress, it won't fire. It, it Even if it doesn't have stuck threads, they're doing useful, like that. the only things that could do useful work are all stuck. If there's anything still uh, spinning, um, it doesn't fire. Uh, this is, of course, by design uh, because they want the uh, the low overtime runhead or low low, low runtime overhead and no false positives. Where where explicit design goals for the deadlock detector. Um, you know, this thing is running on every single piece of Go code. Uh, you don't want it uh, making everything half the you know half the speed of it that it should be. Um, so of course, it's not useful for catching deadlocks in extremely complex locking systems where it'd be most useful. And you know, if you if you have, you know, it's very simple system where you can, you know, you can, you can credit deadlock easily, um, you know, as a toy system, great. It's, it's great for that. But if you have, you know, a thousand, a thousand Go routines running and half of them are locked at, at one time, is that a deadlock? Is that just your system locks a lot? It's hard. It's impossible for the Go detector, for the, de the deadlock detector to know that uh, easily without doing a lot of checking. Uh, there are tools in which people have written that try to make it easier and do more work on top of the good deadlock detector. Um, 
at the time this paper was written, they didn't, they didn't, either this didn't exist or they didn't want to try it, but someone has, has written something called Go Deadlock, which replace, which uh, gives a drop in replacement for the mutex, uh, which does lock order tracking and attempts to catch cases where locks are locked and unlocked non sequentially and out of order. Um, even if they don't cause an immediate deadlock, it'll, it'll throw up warnings saying, hey, you did lock A, lock B, unlock A, unlock B. And that means you could deadlock, like, you know, a warning, warning, warning. Um, so obviously it has more overhead than the runtime, than the built-in runtime detector, but it, you know, might be useful as a, as a build option for tests and such. Uh, additionally, people have filed issues on the Golang, uh, the Go repo, uh, talk, calling for a partial deadlock detector. Um, uh, of course, one of the developers says, well, the devil is in the details on that. It's a lot easier to say it'd be great to have, but I think the Go, develop, the Go team would say, yes, it'd be great to have. Um, but developing such a thing uh, would be uh, completely, would be a lot harder uh, than it sounds, I think, in, 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 in a way that's performant, in a way that doesn't have a lot of like, uh, uh, false positives. It's, it's not solving the halting problem, but it's, 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 it's kind of like solving the halting problem. <laughs> so that's a, that's a, that's a problem. Uh, but it is, it is something I'm sure there's more research being done on. And if, and if someone came up with a good solution, I'm sure the Go team would be happy to implement it and, and pull it in. Even if it didn't catch everything, uh, any improvement is better over than, uh, than locking everything. Um, for non-blocking bugs, uh, there's the race detector. Uh, the race detector in Go is you pass dash race uh, to your compiler. Uh, and it'll compile in a data race detector. It's using an al the happen before algorithm uh, from Thread Sanitizer, which is a C library, I believe. Uh, it can be enabled by building a program with the race flag. Uh, during execution, the race detector creates up to four shadow words for every memory object to store historical accesses of the object. It compares every new access with the stored shadow word values to detect possible races. Um, does it work? It caught half of the bugs um, that they tried it on. Uh, seven of 13 traditional bugs and three of four bugs caused by anonymous functions, uh, by which I assume they mean channels, but I'm not positive what that means in this context. Uh, for six of these successes, the database detector reported the bugs on every single run. For the other four, they had to run it up to 100 times for it to fire. Um, having to run it 100 times is not great uh, um, for sure, but it does eventually catch. I mean, data races are hard because they are, of course, very dependent on execution order and the phase of the moon and CPU load and memory order and all sorts of other things that are extremely runtime dependent. Uh, so this is even harder. This is almost harder uh, than the deadlock detector probably. <clears throat> of course, the downsides to running with the race detector, uh, for a typical program, memory usage uh, goes up five to 10 times and execution time slows by two to 20 times, uh, which means you can't run this in prod uh, unless you like everything being, you know, an order of magnitude slower. Uh, and uh, higher memory usage. Uh, the race detector also, I actually saw this bug report go by, I think in the Go Slack. Uh, the race detector currently allocates an extra eight bytes per defer and recover statement. Um, these extra allocations are not recovered until the Go routine that created those statements exits. Uh, that means if you have long running Go routines that periodically issue defer and recovers, the program, motion, program memory usage may grow without bound. <laughs> These memory allocations do not show up in the output of runtime mem read mem stats or runtime pprof. Uh, so I definitely remember some people in uh, the Go uh, Slack complaining that their production uh, their production code seemed to be, seemed to just bloat forever and it never showed up in their profiler or their runtime output. Uh, you know, their uh, the OS would say that it was using twenty gigabytes of memory, and their read mem stats would say. Well, not, you know, we're using five gigs. I don't know what you're talking about. And it turns out they were running the race detector in production. Uh, and it was causing, uh, you know, little eight extra bytes for defer and recover, but over long periods. Uh, and sort of, if you're creating one of, uh, one of those per um, request, uh, the memory usage can grow uh, quite considerably. Um, so those are some of the downsides. Uh, I, I did not, I looked, I did not see any other sort of uh, popular way to try and catch race conditions outside of just using the built-in race detector. Uh, I'm sure they may exist, but I think uh, one of the uh, it's not something you can do very easily in a library. You have to do it. You have to do it at the runtime level, at the at the language level. Um, so it's a little harder to get a drop and replacement like the uh, the library there. 
and that's it. That's all I got. Um, I hope you enjoy the paper. I hope you enjoy the talk. I hope you enjoy the paper. It's a good paper to read as it does have some interesting ideas and it is uh, interesting in a number of ways. I think it does prompt some interesting questions about way, if, if nothing else, it prompts questions about how we think about these things and, um, uh, uh, and, and ways which, which, in which the assertions we make about the program language we use, the programs, program language we use uh, may or may not stand to actual scrutiny. I see a couple questions popping in. Uh, are you aware of any methods to detect misusage of weight groups, et cetera, like linters? Uh, I am personally not. I know that there are things like static check, um, which try and do more than just uh, static check and uh, uh, go please, which I know have a lot of sort of built-in stack uh, uh, type checking at, uh, you know, you know uh, static checking of your language to, see, to check these sorts of things. I'm not sure how much they look at things like misuse of concurrency primitives. Um, I, I, you know, I would, I would definitely look at things like stack check uh, if that's the question. Uh, another question, is there a particular concurrency testing methodology developers can adopt to find or prove bugs to prevent regressions? Uh, run, with the, run your test with the race, race detector uh, is a great one. Uh, it does, it's not perfect, but it does work. Um, it can catch, um, it can definitely catch cases where you're doing things out of order or re referencing memory uh, in ways that are unsafe, um, for sure. Um, good test coverage on top of that helps a lot. Obviously, you can't run the if, if running your test with a race detector, uh, but you're testing, you're not testing the code in sort of comprehensive ways, then you're not going to catch anything. Um, those would be the two things off the top of my head I can think of. Uh, that would be the easiest sort of like way to get it into a loop uh, and get it into a larger sort of organizational thing. Um, off the top of my head. Other questions? This has been great. I'm getting a little hoarse, but oh man, I've been going for an hour and a half. Okay. I wasn't sure how long it's going to take. I was, I was hoping it wasn't going to get done in 45 minutes. So. As mentioned, these slides will be online on, on my GitHub. Um, the link was put in, I think it was put in the chat, definitely going to be in the Slack, which is uh, papersofthelove.slack.com. You can get an invite to that at uh, from papersofthelove.org. I think it's in the top bar. Um, join us. We're ha hanging out in our general room, hanging out in the NYC room. Um, uh, have, have you encountered a currency bug in your or your company's Go code? I actually generally, like I said, generally don't work with... Um, uh, generally don't work with a lot of concurrency uh, and uh, primitives in my day job. It's almost entirely request in, request out um, type of stuff. So I actually haven't had to deal with a lot of this, but I did find the paper uh, very fascinating. And I want to I want to try and experiment with more, more of it in some of my personal stuff. So someone else says all the time. So all right. We'll have the video up on YouTube probably in the next few weeks. I'm not sure exactly how that'll work. So we've already done this before. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. I think we're going to go ahead and call it there. Um, Darren, say something in the Slack if it's a bad idea, but I think we're going to go ahead and, and, and end it. Cool. Uh, keep an eye out. Uh, we'll, we'll hopefully do something like this again um, if people like it. Um, then we'll, we'll try it again sometime. So thanks. See ya. <laughs>